It's Tuesday, January 16th, and this is The National. Tonight, how a teenage girl's quick thinking alerted police to the horrors inside this California house and freed her 12 brothers and sisters. The mistake that shortchanged some Canadian veterans by hundreds of dollars a month, why others may want to double check their benefits. But we begin with a high stakes international meeting here in Vancouver and what to do about North Korea. We seek neither a regime change nor a collapse. What we do want is to resolve this crisis peacefully, to achieve what is in our collective best interests. We will not accept a nuclear armed North Korea. We are ready for serious negotiations. North Koreans know our channels are open and they know where to find us. Chrystia Freeland and Rex Tillerson side by side tonight as foreign ministers from around the world wrapped up an unprecedented meeting and applied more pressure on North Korea and its nuclear ambitions. Katie Simpson now on whether the meeting will actually address the threat facing the international community. Standing united, foreign ministers in Vancouver delivered a warning to North Korea. Stop your weapons development or face more isolating punishments. Investing in nuclear weapons will lead only to more sanctions and to perpetual instability on the peninsula. Delegates from 20 countries agreed today to continue a coordinated pressure campaign against North Korea through sanctions. We must increase the cost of the regime's behavior to the point that North Korea comes to the table for credible negotiations. Despite agreement around the table, no new measures were announced, aside from Canada investing $3 million in a sanctions enforcement training program. It would help if Russia and China were involved in this meeting because we can't enforce the sanctions without China particularly and Russia also. Neither China nor Russia were invited to the summit, which has led to skepticism about how much impact the talks will have. But some argued diplomacy may already be working since North and South Korea recently reopened talks for the first time in two years. Despite the long absence, I have to report that the dialogue has been rather productive and positive. The new dialogue is a welcome break in the illegal weapons testing carried out by North Korea. But Kim Jong-un's motives are being questioned. I believe that North Korea wants to buy some time to continue their nuclear and missile programs. They simply want to get something out of this dialogue. Katie Simpson is here in Vancouver. And so, Katie, the big question, is anything expected to change as a result of these talks? In the short term, Ian, no. Consider this a warning shot that if North Korea doesn't stop its weapons development, it will be slapped with even more sanctions. For immediate changes, these countries really need to get China and Russia on board with the plan to make sure those sanctions are being fully enforced. But it doesn't look like Moscow or Beijing want to do more on that front since they've been openly criticizing this meeting for about a week now. Interesting that the site of these talks was in Canada. What does this country get by, by being a co-host? Well, this kind of gathering certainly doesn't hurt Canada's reputation on the world stage. But the Canadian government, at its core, truly believes diplomacy has to be the way out of this. And while U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who is the co-host, he believes that too, not everyone in the White House is so supportive. So this summit today helps Tillerson drive that message home to the Trump administration that America's allies want diplomacy and perhaps they should give it more time to develop. All right, Katie, thank you. And as we just heard, notably absent at this Vancouver gathering, China and Russia, two key players that not only share land borders with North Korea, but are also Kim Jong-un's main allies. Besides the co-hosts, Canada and the United States, there are also senior officials from 18 other nations here in Vancouver. Some you'd expect, such as South Korea and Japan, but others that might surprise you. Keep in mind, the guest list is made up of countries that contributed troops or equipment to the United Nations side of the Korean War from 1950 to 53. That's why Greece, Norway, and Colombia are in, and China and Russia, which backed the North during the war, are not. China, North Korea's main trading partner, reacted angrily to not having a seat at the table, calling it Cold War thinking to involve only those allies which supported the South decades ago. Beijing dismissing the meeting as meaningless without them, 
claiming it could even destabilize the region and create divisions within the international community. This morning, China blasted the international community on state-run TV just as the talks began in Vancouver. Unity on the issue is extremely important, this news bulletin said. Russia has gone a step further. Its foreign minister condemning the summit as harmful and destructive. On the eve of the meeting, tensions getting even higher after another false North Korea missile warning, the second in just days. Last week, as you'll remember, it was Hawaii that sent out an official emergency alert. This time it happened in Japan. The state broadcaster NHK sent out this news alert by accident. North Korea likely to have launched missile, evacuate inside the building or underground. Of course, there was no ballistic missile over Japan. NHK correcting the mistake within a few minutes and then apologizing. But it would have been a scary few minutes for people who received uh, that message. And Adrian, let's turn to the United States now. You're following developments tonight on a disturbing story. You're right, Ian. The setting for this is Paris, California. I think most people who live there would probably say it's a pretty ordinary American town. But ordinary does not get the kind of international attention the community about 100 kilometers southeast of Los Angeles is receiving today. This is after the emergence of a cruel and twisted story involving a local family. The parents are facing multiple charges. 13 of their children were found malnourished, some of them chained and shackled. CBC's Kim Brunhuber was in Paris as officials revealed the horrifying details. As crime scenes go, almost every house of horrors looks normal, and this one is no different. But the story of what went on inside this ranch-style bungalow defies belief. Thirteen children held captive by their parents, it's believed, for years. But it seemed that the mother was perplexed as to why we were uh, at, at that residence. The youngest child was two years old, but incredibly seven of them were adults, ranging in age from 18 to 29. They were taken to hospital where staff in the child abuse unit say they were heartbroken by what they saw. The long-term needs of these kids are going to be uh, the psychological and psychiatric needs um, um, due to the prolonged periods of um, starvation mal uh, and maltreatment. Their parents, David and Louise Turpin, seen in this surveillance video being led away by police, have been charged with several counts of torture and child endangerment. The home was listed as a school, David Turpin, its principal. Louise Turpin's sister and brother say she had cut off all communication with the family. They say they hadn't seen the children in years. I can't imagine what they've been through. I just want to hug them. I'm very angry with them, but then feel bad for the kids. Among the questions still to be answered, how long had the children been captive and why had neighbors never noticed? Those who live on the street say the family was reclusive, to the point that Robert Gomez Jr., whose backyard abutted theirs, didn't even know they had kids. It's just crazy to think that something like that can happen, like, next door. Some thought it was odd that with a house full of children, so few of them ever came out to play. Now they know the horrifying reason why. It's heartbreaking. And to, to now to know that there were that much kids in there and not even know about it then, it's like... I wish there was something this community could have done. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Paris, California. In Toronto tonight, a newborn baby is in critical condition and police are still trying to get to the truth of why. It all started this morning when police got a call about a baby being found abandoned outside at a commercial plaza in Toronto's West End. But tonight, it's unclear what actually happened or whether the baby was ever outside. All we know is that the newborn is now in hospital and the mother has been located by police. Officers say they are still investigating. An Ontario man is stuck in a painful dilemma. He may never see his father alive again because U.S. officials won't let him cross the border, nor will they tell him why. As Chris Glover explains, time is not on his side. Assalamu alaikum, Abuji. His father is dying of terminal brain cancer and lives in Cleveland, about 500 kilometers from the man's home in Mississauga, Ontario. So what are you doing there? Uh, we're doing an interview about uh, my situation and how I was, how I've been going to the United States my whole life, but recently, um, for whatever reason, I've been denied entry, and I, I can't find out why. Keep on trying. Inshallah. 
We're not revealing his identity because he worries the stigma could affect his employment. Neither American nor Canadian authorities will tell him why he's been blocked from the U.S. three times since 2013. I haven't really heard much back from them. I've written letters to them multiple times, and I'm really trying to get answers and just trying to get help. It began when he returned to Canada in 2013 after a two-year stint teaching English in Egypt and immediately faced scrutiny at the border. Yeah, it'd be nice to just to get a reason as to why. He shot video of it happening. Shortly after, Canada's spy agency tried to set up a meeting with him. And um, to me, that was, it wasn't a coincidence. You know, there was something going on there. He says he had met with CSIS agents years before as part of so-called outreach to the Muslim community. This time, he told CSIS to pay for his lawyer or no meeting. For me to spend, go out and spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer and meet with them when I know I didn't do anything wrong. One possible explanation he was turned away at the border is a loose affiliation with this man, Damien Claremont, one of a cluster of men from Calgary who died overseas after joining foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria. The Mississauga man lived in Calgary around the time they would have been radicalized. But just because you interacted with someone doesn't mean, obviously, that you're guilty or associated with that person. But sometimes the people adjacent to radicalized men turn out to be even more dangerous, says this former CSIS analyst. I was privy to investigations where person A was the primary person of interest, and yet it turned out that somebody who came in much later into that person's area of responsibility, if you will, turned out to be much more serious in terms of threats to national security. The truth is the U.S. has the right to bar any foreigner from the country. A human rights lawyer says an appeal is possible, but the Mississauga man doesn't even know what he's appealing. Without being charged, what is very disappointing as a society is that we have accepted that you are uh, punished uh, just by virtue of being a suspect without any transparency, without any information available. Meanwhile, the only thing he knows is these are his father's last days. I have faith in God and the, the Canadian and American people that they will try to let me in, in on grounds of compassion. Each call he's worried will be their last. Chris Glover, CBC News, Mississauga. So how unusual is this? Well, Canada Border Services Agency says it doesn't keep stats on Canadians denied entry into the U.S. or why and suggested we call the Americans. So we did. The U.S. has meticulous notes about what happens at the southern border, but not for the northern border. The answer to that question was effectively, we'll get back to you. But this isn't the first time we've heard the stories of people turned away from the border without an explanation. Erwood Jutt's story sounds a lot like the one you just saw in Chris's report. If the Americans don't want me, then I guess it's their loss. I, I think I've taken every step I could to clear my name. Um, I just really hope that they don't think I'm a bad person. We spoke with Judd at his Windsor home back in 2015 because he'd been persistently blocked from entering the U.S., even though he doesn't have a record and had never been arrested. He was convinced the problem was because he'd reached out to CSIS to share with the spy agency that he knew some Canadians who'd gone to fight with ISIS. Helping the security services, he said, was the right thing to do, something police have long encouraged Canadians to do. But he's sure it cost him dearly that somehow the Americans found out about his conversations with CSIS. So much for the career he had in the trucking industry with his dad, he had to abandon that. If people know what's happened to you, that you can't go into the States and that you were talking openly with CSIS, do you think they're telling their kids, you know, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, don't talk to the cops. Uh, definitely. I know I have a, I have a lot of friends that uh, that are basically adopting that same mentality because they don't want to end up going through what I've gone through. We checked in with Jut today. All these years later, he still has not been able to get into the U.S., has filed freedom of information requests on his case, and is still unable to overturn an American ruling he still doesn't understand. There are concerns the U.S. Capitol could come to a grinding halt this weekend, a potential government shutdown looming with funding expiring on Saturday. Both Republicans and Democrats are distracted, fighting over immigration reform. President Trump has repeatedly said any deal needs to address funding for a border wall. Factor in the fallout from Trump's comments on Africa, and it is a mess. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, there are few signs of a solution. 
Congress has three days to pass a bill to keep the government running. How's the progress? According to Republican Senator Lindsey Graham... This has turned into a S show, and we need to get back to being a great country. Politicians are being liberal with S-words these days, ever since Donald Trump reportedly referred to African countries as shitholes in a meeting last week. Rejecting a bipartisan compromise that would see Democrats vote to keep the government running in return for protection for so-called dreamers, undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. A majority of my caucus, um, myself included, we will not fund the government without a DACA deal. Finding new solutions, however, has been overshadowed by much discussion of who remembers what about the president's vulgar words. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen was in the meeting, but told the Senate Judiciary Committee she can't recall much. The president used strong language. What was that strong language? Uh, let's see. Strong language there was... Uh... I, apologies, I don't remember specific word. Prompting outrage from Democrats. Your silence and your amnesia is complicity. So did you say that you want more people to come in from Norway? Did you say The president, you asked today Norway? about immigration, true, didn't discriminate against much. anyone. I want them to come in from everywhere, everywhere. Thank you very much, everybody. Adding confusion to the chaos. And the clock is ticking. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. And with all that going on, special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Trump's alleged Russian ties is reportedly getting closer to the president. The New York Times reporting that Mueller has issued a subpoena against Steve Bannon, Trump's exiled former top strategist. This is the first time Mueller has called anyone this close to the president to testify before a grand jury. His critics might disagree, but it appears Donald Trump's cognitive abilities are just fine. Results of his first medical checkup since taking office are out. It included a cognitive assessment done at Trump's own request. The, the fact that the president got, you know, 30 out of 30 on that exam, I think that, you know, there's no indication whatsoever that he has any cognitive issues. There, there wasn't a lot to go on here, you know, as far as giving, you know, making him healthier in the, in the, year, to, in the year coming, other than uh, incorporating an exercise routine, working on his diet and having him lose some exercise. Those things will make him much healthier next year than he is now, although his health is excellent right now. All in all, Jackson says the president is in pretty decent shape for a 71-year-old. He credits Trump's not smoking and not drinking alcohol. We've learned Trump takes aspirin for heart health, medication to lower his cholesterol levels, and Propecia for hair loss. Jackson acknowledged Trump is borderline obese and said that he's advised the president to eat better and start exercising. And Adrian, we know a bit more about the cognitive test that Trump took. We tracked down a copy online. Let's show you uh, a couple of uh, excerpts from that test. This first one involves naming these animals. Seems pretty simple to most people who are watching. Look at this next one, though. This is on abstraction. You need to uh, figure out the what ties those two things together in each case. Uh, train a bicycle, pretty easy. Modes of transportation. I have to admit, I panicked when I saw the next one. Took me a few seconds to come up with the connection between those two. But you got it, right? <laughs> I got it, although I figure if you're over 30, the connection is these are things that maybe measure, uh, you know, time and, and distance. If you're under 30, you think they're things that are, have been replaced by smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, it turns out that this test he took was designed by a Canadian. It's called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And there's another twist. Uh, Dr. Ziad Nasruddin is an immigrant. He fled to Canada when he was 15 from Lebanon place that was in the throes of civil war at the time. And tonight, he tweeted this, that Trump's perfect score on MOCA is reassuring in terms of his cognitive functions. The test does not, however, assess judgment or personality. So this release of the president's health information only started back in the 1970s. It's actually not mandated. There's no constitutional obligation or no legal law that requires it. But many say the public has a right to know. A lot of presidents have been really sick men, and a lot of that information has been hidden from the public. In fact, nearly half the presidents in U.S. history have had some fairly serious ailments while in office. Grover Cleveland had a secret surgery for oral cancer in 1893. Woodrow Wilson had a serious stroke in 1919 that was kept quiet. His wife, Edith, took over his work until his term ended. 
Franklin Roosevelt hid his paralysis from polio from the public for much of his time in office. No one knew how dire his health was while he ran for a fourth term. He died 82 days after inauguration. John F. Kennedy also had hidden health problems, including Addison's disease and back pain so severe it required frequent injections. And there are still questions about whether Ronald Reagan suffered from Alzheimer's while in office. His diagnosis was revealed five years later. Well, here's what else we're following on The National tonight. Learning more about the 15-year-old caught in the crossfire in Vancouver, who he is, and more about what happened. The golden couple of ice dance will carry Canada's flag into the opening ceremony in Pyeongchang. We'll show you the Olympic flag bearer announcement. And Canada's BlackBerry trying to regain some of that lost glory, and not in the way you might think. The company sees its future in driverless cars. You probably had read and heard about autonomous vehicle could be hacked, or connected car could be hacked. A hacked car, unfortunately, is like a weapon. And so the government are very interested, the industry are very interested. On The National Tonight, we know the name of the 15-year-old killed in Vancouver as his family happened to be driving by two people shooting at each other. He's been identified as Alfred Wong, and Anita Bath has more on how his community is reacting. As you'd expect, it's been a very difficult day for those who knew the boy. The secondary school he attended in Coquitlam, just outside of Vancouver, had grief counselors on hand. Many students visibly upset outside the school. One of his friends posted to social media today on Reddit. He said that they went to a middle school program for gifted students together. He says, my friend was a strong, smart, and loyal person. He was very trustworthy. I loved him as a friend, not because of his achievements, but because of his personality himself. Now, I went to Alfred's church today and sat down with his pastor. He says the family is exhausted. They don't want to talk to anyone at this time. And part of it is that they're extremely concerned with the fact that the shooter is still on the loose. I'm told they're worried about putting out their son's picture into the public because they're concerned about what could happen in terms of retaliation if they did that. Now, the VPD has poured resources into this. More than 50 officers are working on the case. And Metro Vancouver has been plagued with gun violence recently. A former, a longtime senior member of the VPD, Cash Heed, says he cannot remember a time where this many officers and resources were put into one single shooting investigation. You'll have some integrated regional resources applied to deal with this. You'll have assistance from some of the other municipal agencies uh, to ensure that we have a successful conclusion to this. The public is at risk. You have police agencies telling you the public's not at risk. Well, this is a, an example of why the public is at risk when any of this gunplay is played out in public places. One last note to mention, we do now know more about the man that police believe was the intended target, Kevin Whiteside. His family today say that they are very upset and they send their condolences to Alfred Wong's family. I need a bath in our newsroom here in Vancouver. Ahead on the national, when working hard doesn't get you ahead. I don't have many choices. I see either I eat some days or I don't. There are days that I go without eating. Nick Purden learns about life on minimum wage. Plus, multi-medalist Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer will lift the flag for the opening ceremonies of their final Olympics. How they got here, coming up. From price increases at coffee shops and restaurants to fears about lost tips, benefits, and even jobs. Rising minimum wages across Canada has caused a lot of concern lately, and today even more. This time, among parents of young children who are reeling from a sudden rise in daycare fees. Lorenda Redekop has the story. Karen Aitken has two toddlers in daycare. She says it was already expensive. Now it's up $368. It means for both kids, it costs more than $2,000 a month. We've definitely had to do some reevaluating the decision whether or not we can afford to 
put our three-year-old in swimming lessons or skating lessons, we've decided to hold back on, on those extracurriculars. And she's not alone. I think it was honestly shock. Michelle Quirkapome in Burlington got a letter from her daycare. Six days before Christmas, you get this message saying, by the way, next month you have $630 more you have to spend on daycare. The reason given, Ontario's minimum wage hike. There's rent control. There should be some sort of control on daycare rates so that, you know, in, in a, overnight, rates can't go up by 24%. Her daycare wouldn't talk to CBC, but did confirm its rates went up. Last night, the Premier acknowledged the concerns, tweeting that she's working to keep costs down with special funding for childcare centres. Joan Brain runs two daycares in Ontario and says she hasn't seen any money yet. She had no choice but to up her prices, so far by a dollar a day per child. And she worries she may have to increase them even more because we won't be able to make ends meet. Because unfortunately, um, our food costs are going to go up, our uh, any um, toys and equipment, all the other costs are going to go up. When Alberta's minimum wage increased, so did fees at some daycares. Nothing like these amounts. However, their wage hike was also smaller. It's a percentage. Karen Aitken wants to shift the discussion altogether towards universal child care. People say, I, I don't, why do I have to pay for your child to go to daycare? Well, why do I have to pay for your lung cancer treatment? It's about society working together. Michelle Quirkapom isn't waiting for that discussion. She found a different child care centre and now she's actually saving money. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Burlington, Ontario. I feel like I'm trapped in a bubble all the time. Like on a constant hamster wheel that I can't get out of it. And I try, no matter what I do, I just can't seem to get out of it. That is Kevin, one of a shocking number of Canadians earning minimum wage and yet still among the working poor. These are people who have full-time jobs but struggling to make it on their own, even with the recent wage hikes. As Nick Purden found out, it makes for a difficult life with some difficult choices. There are more than a million Canadians who work minimum wage jobs. More than a million. That's 8% of Canada's salaried employees. I mean, think about that for a minute. Maybe try to imagine making your own life work on minimum wage. But here's the thing about imagination and statistics. They only get you so far. You know when you really start to understand minimum wage? when you meet the people. That's why I've come here to St. Francis Table. It's a restaurant for the poor. You pay a dollar, you get a meal. What's remarkable is it used to be pretty much only homeless people and people on social assistance who ate here. But nowadays, people on minimum wage come here too. The first person I meet is Yuzel Amaro. He's not just one of the cooks here. He tells me he's one of the working poor himself and that he needs more than one job to make ends meet. Handling three jobs or two jobs at a time for years, it just takes a lot of time out of you and uh, it's, it's tough, it's tough. A lot of time goes by on just paying bills. For years and years and years, I worked seven days a week. It was up till recently that I just decided for 100 or 200 dollars on a paycheck, I needed a day off, you know? Uh, so I decided to take Sundays off. And uh, I just can't wait for Sundays. Uh, you know, after working 15 years in a row, almost uh, seven days a week. So what are the hard choices that you have to make based on how much money you make? I think uh, the tough one for me would be no being able to just uh, support my family in Cuba, you know. Uh, no being able to just go out with a girlfriend, you know, when I really want to. You know, I just wish I would be getting paid more. Um, um, now that they're going to make it to 14, I think that is an improvement. I don't think that will solve any major problems uh, in anybody's life, especially with uh, prices going up. 
A few tables away, I meet Peter Jakinis. Peter works for a temp agency, and he fell into debt a few years ago and had to declare bankruptcy. I'm going through the organization. Peter says he'd rather talk somewhere more private. What can you tell me about making minimum wage? Well, you, you, you can live. Well, actually, you, you can exist, but you can't necessarily live, I would say. That's the best way to, to describe it. You, you need a little more to get by. It's tough. You have to really skimp on everything, uh, clothes, uh, food. You said you can exist, but you don't live. What, what does that mean? Well, it, it, you, you can exist. You can get by. You know, you can find ways to get by, but you don't have any of those extra things. You know, uh, man does not live by bread alone. He, you know, you need, you need recreation, you need uh, entertainment and, and things like that. You need a little extras other than just making sure your bills are paid and, and your rent is paid and so on. Right. You know, why not uh, go to a, a movie once in a while? Why not go to a ball game once in a while? I mean, is that such too much to ask for someone who's just putting in hours and no matter what they're doing for a living? I get the feeling from Peter that he's more or less resigned to his situation. But back in the restaurant, I meet someone who's anything but. Kevin Johnson's 37, he's been to college, and still, he says the only work he can find pays minimum wage. I work in a plant, and it's overnight. Like a, like a factory? It's like a factory that makes boxes. And it's a very boring, very repetitive job. And, and I'm thinking, I just took a travel and tourism course. Why am I having to do this? Tell me why you come here. I come here just to uh, save a little money and so I can keep, keep a roof over my head, first of all, and to keep my gym membership. Because without my gym membership, I would get very depressed. And so I want to keep that going. What do you think people across the country don't understand about people who work a minimum wage? What they don't understand is how tough it is and how, how, it, how, it's, how it's so difficult to budget your money. And like I, right now, I need to buy a few things. I need a warmer jacket, first of all. Like this jacket is OK for milder winter days. But when it gets really cold, like when we had that cold snap, I was freezing in this thing. And I'm thinking, well, I can't afford to buy another jacket. And the problem is with this job that I have, I'm having to walk, taking the night bus as far west as I can, and then having to walk for an hour in the freezing cold because I cannot afford to take a cab to get home. Tell me about the choices that you have to make. I don't have many choices. I see either I eat some days or I don't. There are days that I go without eating. Like a couple of days last week, I just went to work, drank lots of water, didn't eat. Because I'm waiting for me to, my next paycheck to come in. What's it like to say that? You have a full-time job, you work hard. And I have nothing to show for it? It's terrible and it's embarrassing, but there's nothing I can do about it. Once he's out on the street, you'd never know Kevin's situation, that he has a full-time job and he can barely make ends meet. I mean, that's the thing about poverty in Canada. It can sometimes be hard to spot. But one thing is certain, it includes people on minimum wage. Sometimes I go for little walks on Friday, Saturday nights downtown, you know, and I see other people, they're going out to restaurants and bars, having a nice dinner. But why can't I have that? What am I doing wrong? Because I'm struggling and being envious of what they're doing, wishing that I could do it and feel normal. Nick has more from Usdale, Paul, and Kevin, and you can share it from our Facebook page, and you can always find powerful images on Instagram and tweet us at CBC The National. Consumer safety, costly recalls, and a brand reputation are at stake for automakers, especially when software can be compromised by a cyber attack. Canada's BlackBerry built a global reputation with its pioneering smartphones, but then Apple and others caught up. But now the Canadian company is gaining ground in the auto industry with software that could save lives. Today, Renee Filipponi caught their sales pitch. The Detroit Auto Show is where automakers come to show off their very latest in design. 
Along with horsepower, powertrains, and high performance braking systems, these days it's the invisible computer technology taking the driver's seat. Please welcome John Chen. Thank you, everybody. And, and that's why BlackBerry CEO John Chen uh, is here. BlackBerry and Detroit Auto Show, what is the connection to the two? I'm here to try to explain to that. You please play the video. It's his first visit to the auto show. His mission is to sell the tech company's encryption and security reputation, the protection of your personal information, and its quest for redemption. Ace, we will provide the security protocol of how things talk to each other inside a car. Um, other people will be maybe providing a dashboard, uh, they may be providing a lane changing code, or, uh, and so forth and so forth. So, so it's very important that you create a communication platform inside a car that connects all the other, all the other things safely, securely, and that's what we do. BlackBerry quit making physical phones two years ago, unable to compete with the likes of Apple and Samsung. The few that are still out there are made by third-party manufacturers. In an attempt to save the company, Chen shifted focus to software, and more specifically, the operating system it bought back in 2010, QNX. And BlackBerry bought the company several years ago with a focus to use parts of that software in a new operating system for its phones. Now, the phones didn't work out, so they had to find another way to use QNX. Um, this was about the time where cars were becoming computers on wheels. So BlackBerry saw an opportunity to put QNX in uh, computer systems that would help to drive cars. For years, BlackBerry software has been running onboard infotainment systems in cars. In fact, 60 million vehicles have them. But now the company wants in on the self-driving car game, and they are creating an operating system for autonomous vehicles that works like Microsoft Windows does for your home computer. And this week, they've unveiled new cybersecurity software to help detect vulnerabilities in cars. OK, hold on tight. Hold on. The risks are real. He's not getting out of that. I'm going to act as today's crash test dummy while Charlie and Chris hijack its digital systems. From In this video, a pair of cybersecurity no researchers show He's how easy it is to game. hack a vehicle. Something just turned on all the fans. And by taking control remotely of this Jeep. I can't turn it down. So we're killing the engine right now. Chrysler recalled more than a million vehicles after the discovery. Software and the security of that software is critical. Ross McKenzie is with the Waterloo Center for Automotive Research. He says it's not just hackers that pose a risk for connected vehicles. So imagine if you're at a uh, intersection and you're in the left turn lane and I'm beside you and you've got a wireless system in your vehicle that sends a signal from your turn signal handle back to the rear taillight to make the left turning lamp flash. Well, we don't want that wireless communication to come across the lane into my car and make my left turn lamp flash. BlackBerry will continue advancing this scanning technology. But BlackBerry isn't alone in developing operating systems for self-driving cars. Giants like Apple, Google's Alphabet, Tesla are all in the game. If, if it's entirely like you said, it only the big boys win, I suggest that we're the big boys in that sector. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with our posture. The company already has partnerships with major car companies, plus a number of other tech companies wanting in on self-driving cars. A lot of people have still written BlackBerry out. Um, BlackBerry is still a fraction of what it used to be. It's not a $20 billion company anymore. It, it's, it generates roughly $1 billion in annual revenue. Um, but going forward, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be paying close attention to what John's doing in the auto sector. I oh, don't want to blow my own horn, <laughs> but I think you will agree with me that um, four years ago, uh, everybody would count BlackBerry out. Um, and, um, and even if we are able to sell the company, um, it will be sold for a very small amount of money. Uh, my job is to not only turn it around from a financial point of view, but to create a future that we could be iconic again. No matter what you think of the mistakes the company made, it never lost its reputation for encryption and security, and it's betting on that for its future. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Detroit. For the first time ever, not one, but two Canadian athletes will carry the maple leaf at the opening ceremony of an Olympic Games.
Star figure skating duo Tessa Virtue, Scott Moyer, will lead about 230 Canadian athletes into the stadium in Pyeongchang next month. That announcement was made today in Ottawa. They will be carrying not just the Canadian flag, but the hopes of every young person who aspires to represent Canada at the Olympics someday. This is undoubtedly the pinnacle of our career. This is for you guys. Take care of it. Wave it with pride. I look at Tessa, I just think, like, this is such a funny little relationship that we have because it's better than it was um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, winning the Olympics in our biggest fights, like, in our highest moments. I think now it's better than it's ever been. The greatest ice dance team the world has ever seen. Tessa Virtue, Scott Moyer, they make everybody in the game better. We want to be a part of this team one more time. Um, to be picked as flag bearers is an honor that we won't seem to forget. Looking to end their career with another Olympic gold medal. If they skate like that in Pyeongchang, they will capture that. Good luck at the Olympics, Scott and Tessa. CBC TV app. Download now. On the next burden of truth. I'm your lawyer, not your friend. You think these girls are doing this to themselves? The chemical damage explains the symptoms. You can't just storm in there. Come home, Joanna. You really want to throw it all away from Millwood? Burden of Truth, Wednesday at 8 on CBC. On The National tonight, five U.S. naval officers are facing negligent homicide charges in connection with last year's deadly collisions at sea. A total of 17 sailors were killed in two separate incidents involving U.S. naval destroyers colliding with other ships. In a statement today, the Navy said the commanding officers of those ships, the USS John S. McCain and the USS Fitzgerald, are among those charged. The Navy previously said both collisions were avoidable. The Danish submarine inventor arrested last August after the disappearance of a Swedish journalist has been charged with her murder. Peter Madsen charged today with multiple counts, including murder, dismemberment, and the indecent handling of a corpse. Police believed he killed Kim Wall on his sub, dismembered her body, and dumped her remains in the sea. We're still waiting to see if jurors at the Lac Megantic trial are able to reach unanimous verdicts. Today, on the sixth day of deliberations, the group said it had hit an impasse. But the judge urged them to try once more to reach an agreement. Three men are charged with criminal negligence causing death in the 2013 derailment that killed 47 people in Lac Megantic. They pleaded not guilty. And Canada's speed skating head coach has taken a leave of absence less than a month out from the Olympics. The CBC has also confirmed the organization is conducting an investigation, though it's not clear why. Speed Skating Canada has released no other details other than to say Michael Crow will remain on leave at least until after the Games. An Ottawa woman is being praised for saving an elderly woman from the cold. She looked around, and I could see that she wasn't all together, and then I realized that she had her pajamas on. So I just shoved my pants on, ran downstairs, threw my jacket on, brought her in, warmed her up. It was minus 27 with the wind chill this morning when Penny Tasco noticed the woman outside wandering the streets with just pajamas, a house coat, and socks. Paramedics say she was already suffering from minor frostbite and hypothermia. Are you actually getting all the benefits you're entitled to receive from the government? Well, some Canadians haven't been. All veterans, military and RCMP, and their dependent spouses should be checking their own benefit systems to ensure that they are getting and they're entitled to all the benefits they're receiving. So if you're wondering why Peter Stauffer would send that message today, it's because Veterans Affairs has admitted to a half-million-dollar mistake that shortchanged veterans by hundreds of dollars a month. As Kayla Household tells us, it was a veteran himself who discovered the error. Retired Captain Dennis LeBlanc is quiet after talking about his tours in Afghanistan. He lives with PTSD and was medically released from the Canadian Armed Forces two years ago. 
He expected Veterans Affairs to take care of him and says for the most part it does. LeBlanc receives a monthly benefit payment because of his disability, but when the federal government made changes last April, he knew something wasn't right. And I got a letter saying that, well, no, you don't meet the criteria for a higher grade. For this particular benefit, there are three grades or levels of payment based partly on the number of years a veteran would have had left to serve when they were released in an expected 25-year military career. The uh, career impact allowance is actually designed to, pay, to reimburse people for their loss of ability to generate retirement uh, income. So the, the earlier you get injured in your career, uh, the more of a loss there is. LeBlanc was in the lowest pay category for people who had only five years left to serve. He actually had more than five years left to serve, meaning he was entitled to more money. He reported the matter to the Ombudsman, which prompted Veterans Affairs to investigate. It determined the department had indeed incorrectly rounded LeBlanc's years of service. I realized that, okay, wait, if this is affecting me, this has got to be affecting a lot more people than just me. It turns out LeBlanc was correct. Veterans Affairs admits it made a calculating error that affected 133 veterans across the country. The department has now fixed the mistake, giving each of those veterans an extra $600 a month. That's a car payment. That's, you know, uh, my kid's education fund. I mean, that it was huge. In November, the veterans received all that lost money retroactive to April. This is how the system is meant to work. You know, uh, the ombudsman brings this to our attention. We listen to veterans and, and we check the system. LeBlanc and the veterans ombudsman are encouraging all veterans to ensure they know what they're entitled to and to check whether they're actually getting it. Yeah. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Hanwell, New Brunswick. And that brings us to the end of this edition of The National for January the 16th. Good night. Good night.